unpleasant day, unpleasant uh, subject. So, <clears throat> some interest, interesting statistics we've been uh, exposed to over the last decade, especially in a Western context. And when you look at Australia, we're obviously we're part of that uh, Western uh, parliamentary democratic context. So what I want to talk about is the dramatically increasing levels of anxiety, depression, attempted suicide and suicide amongst younger people in Western society. Now you would think in a period of relative abundance for a significant proportion of the population that we wouldn't find ourselves in this situation. But it's a reality. It's a reality that people have been discussing and battling with for over a decade. And despite uh, the awareness uh, regarding mental health issues, nothing seems to be changing. So let's go to the very basics. Obviously there are two types of depression. There's a reactive depression, which is a reaction to the situation you find yourself in. And obviously there's an endogenous depression which has a genetic link and obviously there's a combination of both both reactive and endogenous they're the two extremes so obviously we haven't seen any significant change in the genome or the DNA of young people in Western societies in the last decade or so. So that to a significant degree excludes the endogenous component. Now it's quite popular, very popular, uh, to blame this increase on social media. And it's a convenient uh, scapegoat in many regards because the rate of increasing depressive illnesses among young people in Western society has coincided with the increased usage of social media almost to a saturation point among young people in Western societies. So it's very easy to point the finger but unfortunately for those people that are pointing the finger there is little scientific evidence to actually um, support that particular theory. Obviously social media does have an impact but that's not the major issue. So if we're not looking at endogenous depressive illnesses and we're not looking at an increased anxiety and depression and attempted suicide amongst younger people in Western societies that's related to that's related to the increased usage of social media. We need to look beyond that. See, in Western societies, if you have an issue, to a significant degree, it's your problem. It's related to somehow to your own deficiencies as an individual. We never look at the structural framework we find ourselves in. Now there have been significant changes in the structural framework in Western so-called liberal parliamentary democracies in the last four to five decades. And these changes have been almost 
universal. And the greatest impact from these changes have been on younger people. As I said before, the impact, the greater impact, have been on younger people. So we need to look at what are these structural adjustments? What has occurred that has changed the relationship of the population as a whole and younger people to what's happening? What are these changes? Now I speak about these changes constantly because changes have impacts on society. They have impacts on individuals. They have impacts on communication. They have inter impacts on interpersonal relationships. Western liberal democratic societies are based on one principle and that's the creation of ever increasing profits for a shrinking minority irrespective of the human social environmental costs. Now we are seeing significant costs in terms of the way people live in society in the last few decades. Now in the post-war generation, in most liberal democracies, you had a social elevator which gave young people options which they could or may have accessed or not. The deregulation, privatisation, globalisation and corporatisation revolution which has swept over the Western liberal democracies has removed many of these options because the primary focus in so-called parliamentary democracies has not been to create an environment which provides the greatest good for the greatest number. What it has done, it has created an environment which creates the greatest good for the least number of people. And those of you who may find this hard to believe, considering the uh, situation you find yourself in, this economically is concerned, the facts are that a lot of this economic prosperity is based on an illusion and that illusion is that that economic prosperity has been brought at the expense of our mental status because most people in one way or another are enmeshed in the economic system. They're enmeshed in the private investment for private profit mantra which dominates every relationship within a capitalist society. We see this over and over again. When I mention the words deregulation, privatisation, globalisation, corporatisation, I think it's important that we explain what it means. And it's important that we go back a few decades. What happened after the atrocities of World War II is that an increasing number of people who were involved in World War II demanded the state intervene to assist the individual and the family and the community. And legislation was passed through parliamentary democracies which provided fundamental services for individuals but more importantly provided a pathway that people could use to improve their economic and situation as well as their mental health. 
because it was a pathway which provided hope for an increasing number of people who had minimal hope in the past. This is what's called a social elevator. Now deregulation means that those legislative uh, legislation that had been put in place to protect people was removed to increase profitability. It meant that the organisations which were created like trade unions to assist people to improve their situation became regulated to such a degree they're no longer able to function as a trade union. It's illegal in this country to withdraw your labour during an enterprise, except during an enterprise bargaining agreement period. So while regulation was removed to allow profits to increase for a minority, regulations was tightened to prevent the organisations which working people had created to improve their situation from actually being able to improve their situation. So we had this dichotomy of deregulation for the business and corporate sector and regulation for people on wages and organisations which represented them. This created a significant amount of anxiety in the population because what happened is the idea of having a job for life or the idea of having stability and security went out the window as we saw more and more individual contracts being introduced. This increased anxiety amongst parents which in many regards uh, was transmitted to children. At the same time with corporatisation, what we saw is the destruction to a significant degree of the, corp of the uh, small business sector. Again, this creates financial instability and it's not the financial instability which pushes people into, that, into the anxiety and depressive, reactive depressive situation they find themselves in. It's that anxiety which financial instability at the same time and globalisation meant that the way people earned an income in Western society, especially wage earners, disappeared all, almost overnight as businesses and corporations sent businesses overseas to areas where there weren't trade unions and there were minuscule labour laws and where people could be bought for a few dollars a day. So while we had an increased flow of consumer goods into the society which were much cheaper or to a significant degree cheaper than if they were manufactured in this country, what we saw is the ability to access these consumer goods was dependent on finance. Now the problem wasn't just consumer goods. The problem was that basic necessities like education and healthcare became corporatized. What that meant is that the access to services to satisfy basic human needs provided by the state disappeared. We saw this with privatisation. privatisation of energy sources, the privatisation of significant sections of the healthcare sector, the privatisation of large segments of the education sector. But more importantly than privatisation, we saw that taxpayers' funds are now used to prop up and finance the private sector. Billions of dollars. At the same time, the public sector is starved of funds. So the services which are provided by the public sector decrease dramatically. 
so what should be access to basic commodities like housing and energy food now become a reality for an increasing number of Australians and their children so what it means is when a young person is involved in the education sector if they decide to do tertiary education and most and over 50 percent do then they are saddled with a huge debt to pay for that so-called public education which is to a significant degree has been privatized so you've got increasing anxiety regarding that at the same time the fact that you start off your life with a significant debt means access to housing becomes a significant issue so issues which we believed had been resolved have now become once again have become important so not having access to health not having access to health care and not having access to education and not having the possibility and the hope to improve your situation at a very young age creates significant anxiety now in primary school in this country and in most western democracies children are told they can be whatever they like as long as they work hard to achieve it the reality is that for a significant number of the population they will never the younger population they will never be able to be what they would like to be they are basically little more than business and factory fodder for a shrinking number of powerful entities which dominate not only economic activity but through that economic economic activity they have put the very survival of the human race on this planet at risk through climate change and the climate emergency so young people are faced with a number of hurdles before they actually enter the workforce the fear of the climate emergency the insecurity of not being able to achieve work the insecurity of not being able to pay for education now obviously as increasing number of people find themselves in these cul-de-sacs these economic cul-de-sacs and mental and social cul-de-sacs where on the one hand they're told they can do whatever they like and be whatever they want to be and on the other hand the reality is very different for them some are able to rely on their parents for financial assistance many aren't because their parents are in the same situation because anxiety is not just an issue and depression for young people it's also an issue for an increasingly elderly population in this country because the privatization of old age through the creation of the superannuation superannuation entities means that when people retire they are constantly under stress in terms of the finances they have accumulated over a lifetime that are there to protect them but the dilemma is the less you earn and the harder you work in society the less your superannuation and especially if you're working part-time because of responsibilities for uh, caring of children the type of superannuation you receive will never be enough to cover you and at the same time we're seeing a whole host of corporate entities pushing retirement living sucking the lifeblood out of superannuants so you've got this increasing anxiety at the beginning of life because it's difficult to move forward and you've got this increasing anxiety at the end of life this reactive depression we see in our society is not totally the fault of the individual 
It is not the fault of increasing levels of endogenous depressive illnesses because of DNA issues. It is a structural problem. It is a problem which is totally related to the type of society we have created. Where the only thing that is important is to create ever increasing profits for a shrinking number of people. On top of that, we have seen the very institutions which were created through struggle and the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people to provide the greatest good for the greatest number being subverted and taken over by corporations and financial interests which are there to influence the, to influence the legislative agenda in such a way that only, that only legislation which doesn't affect their profitability ever goes through Parliament. So finding ourselves in this situation where change seems to be impossible, where the beginning of life becomes more and more difficult as people transition from childhood to teenagehood to adulthood, and seeing what's happening to older people as the private profit for private, private investment for private profit mantra influences, takes over every aspect of our existence. So when people talk about solutions to anxiety, the mental health crisis, interpersonal relationships, the way that interpersonal relationships are affected by this financial system, I think it's important that it's not just a matter of talking to people, although that is assist. It's not just a matter of giving out medications, although that can also assist. But ultimately, it's a matter of us as a people and as a society saying enough is enough, turning our back on what's happened and once again, once again forcing the state to ensure that the basic necessities of every individual in society is put before the prof profitability of an increasing number of, of a decreasing number of individuals and corporations in this country. Ultimately, we're flesh and blood and bones. We are part of the environment. That's why climate change has an impact on us. At the same time, we are part of communities and societies. And if things are going the wrong way, as we are now, especially for younger and older people in our society, it's time that we reassess the structures under which we labour.